welcome to the Innovation Ecosystem Podcast. We interview remarkable and thought-provoking guests about innovation, leadership, and change in the world of business. Whether you're an executive or an entrepreneur, our objective is to help you and your organization create an entrepreneurial culture, become more innovative, and better able to respond to change. Each week, we'll deconstruct world-class performance from the arenas of business, academia, science, and sports. Each week, you can expect key insights, fresh perspectives, and proven tools you can use straight away to make you more successful professionally and personally. With your host, Mark Bidwell. Hello, this is Mark Bidwell. Welcome back to the Innovation Ecosystem Podcast. If this is your first time listening, very warm welcome. Now, in this episode, I'm really pleased to be joined by a friend of mine, writer, speaker, and entrepreneur, Gib Bullock. Now, like me, Gib started his career at British Petroleum, but then he's spent the majority of his career to date at Accenture, where he kicked off and started the ADP, which is Accenture Development Partnerships. And this business unit was set up to leverage Accenture's expertise and experience in service of global development organizations. And as you'll hear us discuss, this has turned out to be hugely successful with Accenture. For example, there's now a waiting list of over 40,000 people, consultants looking to join this from within the ranks of Accenture. And as he describes, the privilege uh, comes with an expectation that you're going to give up half of your salary to participate in the ADP. Now, Gibbs' new book is titled The Intrapreneur, Confessions of a Corporate Insurgent. And he wrote this, he says, to explore new ways of supporting purpose-driven insurgencies within the corporate world. And our discussions cover Gibbs' journey from corporate to consulting to volunteering in the Balkans in the late 1990s and the life-changing impact that that experience had on him and resulting in him setting up ADP. Now, we also talk about how that cycle came to a close for Gibb when he had a breakdown, or as he actually prefers to refer to it, as a breakthrough, an experience that he's chosen to be very, very transparent about in the book with the goal of sharing experiences that entrepreneurs that follow him can learn from. And I'm sure you'll find Gibb's story, his insights, and his perspectives of real value and a real interest one that Arianna Huffington called in the foreword to his book, an inspiring personal account of how purpose and well-being can transform the business world. So without further ado, I'll introduce Gib Bullock. So with me today is Gib Bullock. Nice to see you, Gib. Nice to see you, Mark. So we have a, a shared biography. I mean, we both started our careers at British Petroleum back in the late 80s, early 90s. I'm afraid um, it is that one. Very, 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 I mean, we're very, very close in age as well. Then we both went from the client side to consultancy. You went to Anderson's, which then became Accenture. Correct. I went to the Hay Group. And we were both, I think, started, we, you know, very quickly we realized that we wanted to change the world of consulting. I did that by trying to put Hay Group online. You did something far more significant in the sense that you created a business unit called ADP. And you've written a book about it called The Entrepreneur, The Confessions of a Corporate Insurgent. So, so what are you confessing? <laughs> the, the, the title is something of a, a, a play a bit on that, these um, sort of 70s confessions of a window cleaner, these kind of B-movie things, I suppose. The book is really a story of a personal journey. I'm confessing somewhat to being idealistic, mm -hmm. to being somebody who has believed in the power of, of business to change the world. It seems sounds like you have as well. But more importantly, I think about the power of the individual to change the world of business. Mm -hmm. And that's what's really needed. And so this is a, a memoir of someone who grew up on a small Scottish island, uh, went into the traditional rat race, ended up uh, having a, a, a bit of an epiphany through a volunteering experience. And I found myself trying to start this non-profit group within a for-profit against the odds somewhat. Mm -hmm. And there were successes, the thing grew against the odds. I was delighted there was no other job I actually wanted. There was some awards, there was some promotions. Life was looking pretty sweet. And then crisis hit. And I found myself actually somewhat unexpectedly the resident of a psychiatric ward in Glasgow in my native Scotland. Mm -hmm. And yeah, one minute you're sort of in the fast lane and shaking hands with you know, President Clinton in a New York hotel room and the next minute you're playing a cameo role in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest or something like that. It's a, it's a strange feeling. And I was left really asking myself the question, did I go nuts or is it actually the system I was trying to create change mm -hmm. that's crazy? And that's really the underlying theme of the book. It's a business book, yes, mm -hmm. but it's not your traditional business book. It's set in the context of a businessman finding himself in this unlikely psychiatric ward. And it's 
mixtures of conversations with patients and staff combined with a sort of memoir of different stages of the career from the rat race and thinking mm-hmm. that everything was going well as I was earning a lot of money and driving fast cars and things yeah. going well in London. As, to, as, you, as, you, as you say, you were, you were turning bullshit into air miles. Uh, that was the, uh, that's my favourite definition of a management <laughs> consultant. I was enjoying that life of a, 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 in the fast lane. And then this kind of epiphany around about the uh, 1999, 2000 mark, which led me to volunteer as a business volunteer in the Balkans. Mm-hmm. And that really changed my mind. It changed my career. It's changed my my, my life since. And I came back and scaled up ADP, which I think yeah. I'll talk a bit about. And then ultimately it talks about the, the was it a burnout? Was it a, a breakdown? Was it actually more of a breakthrough that I experienced? And overall, I would say the book is, is something of a call to action for millennials and people within business to really stand up and change business yeah. and drive yeah. change bottom up. And also for leaders to embrace that change and why it's actually in their interest to do so. Mm-hmm. Okay. You've always sort of, and we talked about it over lunch, I mean, you've always characterised yourself as a little bit of an outsider. And when you came back from this experience in Central Europe, the company just gone public, and that's the point at which you set up ADP, right? That's correct. Probably an, an outsider's insider, if you mm-hmm. think, and this is where this entrepreneurship concept comes from. The triggers for this idea really came from the experience of living in the Balkans. I didn't set off to do this. It wasn't something that was on my radar. I read about the opportunity to go and volunteer with VSO. I thought VSO was always for doctors and nurses and teachers. And VSO is Voluntary Service Organisation, right? Voluntary Service Overseas, Overseas actually. It's, yeah. a, it's a well-known British uh, charity, but maybe less well-known elsewhere. But it was a, a volunteering uh, mm-hmm. group who were looking not for money from corporates, which is the usual thing that charities are looking for, but they wanted people and skills Mm -hmm. and they needed business skills, like consulting skills, like accounting skills, like management skills. And the supply just wasn't there. So they came up with what was a very innovative partnership at its time to partner with large corporations and borrow their people for six to 12 months and give them back. Mm -hmm. And it was really in this sort of cold winter nights in Macedonia, thinking about what impact am I having as a little volunteer here for a while, I was on a 90 plus percent salary reduction and mm-hmm. never been more motivated in my life in terms of the work that I was doing, helping small businesses get access to credit, things like that. But the nagging thing in my mind was, how can we industrialize this? How much more could I get done if I had my normal team of people around about me? Yeah. How could we make a business model around this? At the time, and still very much to this day, big consultancies will do pro bono work, they will set aside a budget, they will do some bits and pieces of Mm -hmm. of support to charities and other non-traditional clients when they have the people available and it's relatively small scale. It doesn't get to the Balkans very often, it doesn't get to Kigali, it doesn't get to Kagami and these other places in Africa and where it's most needed. So how could we solve the problem of getting business skills to where they were most needed and where mm-hmm. there was least access? And that was the idea around ADP and the business yeah. model yeah. for ADP. And the business model was, I think, if I get it correct, people cut their salary in half, the firm reduced their overhead charges and yeah, waived their profit. And and those I think those were those the, the main areas of the, the There was really model? three. It was a tripartite mm-hmm. business model, whereas you're you're right, there's a contribution or investment, I called it, from the employees, from the company but it, most importantly from the client as well. Mm-hmm. Okay. So yes, the employees gave up up to 50% of their salary. There were some nuances on that. The firm gave up profit and some of the overhead allocations, mm-hmm. but we covered marginal cost for the business, yeah. for yeah. the shareholders of the business as it came. But the clients, the NGOs initially that we were working with would also pay, but they would pay maybe 20 cents in the dollar, 20 yeah. pence in the pound on normal market rates, so a deep reduction. And mm-hmm. my job as heading this up was to try to make this be break even. So I, I prefer to call it a not for loss business model rather right. than a not for profit. It was trying to actually be cost neutral to mm-hmm. shareholders mm-hmm. and have this impact with our business skills in teams on the ground working to to solve a client's problem. Mm-hmm. So I can imagine that coming up with this idea and selling it into a, a freshly IPO'd organization, which was driven by very clear metrics of sales and delivery wasn't straightforward. So, I mean, how do you go about making that sale internally? Well, it's it's funny actually because the actual the traditional view is you you develop a PowerPoint presentation or a fantastic complex spreadsheet with all the numbers in it. I found myself instead just scribbling in on my way home in a in a cafe it's in Thessaloniki actually on my way home from Macedonia and uh, scribbling a press article, a fake. Mm-hmm 
press article two years into the future mm -hmm. about Accenture's chairman launching this this concept, this new business at Davos, at the World Economic Forum, two years in the future. And then through, I suppose, guerrilla tactics to a certain extent, managed to get it to him. And um, that led to a breakfast, a discussion. And he said in hindsight that, um, you know, someone coming to him and saying, I actually want to half my salary rather than, you know, and these other people do too, when he was used to having people coming in and asking for promotions yeah. or, or, or raises or bonuses and things like that, certainly caught his attention. Mm -hmm. And the business cases and the spreadsheets and the PowerPoint came afterwards. But just to get that initial hook the press release worked and it worked mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. And what was it? I mean, clearly, you know, you're very passionate. You would have come across, I guess, with a, sort of your eyes burning with enthusiasm. I mean, what else was it? In the book, you mentioned that you'd given him a, a knighthood in the article. As well. But was there anything else in um, that you really think? Because, I mean, the, there's an emotional side to it, but there's also a deeply rational side to it, he which got, I guess uh, you appeal to. The chairman did get a knighthood about 10 years later, so it was uh, somewhat uh, prophetic. But uh, I don't believe that in any of these things, you can really appeal to the heartstrings of business leaders. You need mm -hmm. to appeal to their business instincts. So mm -hmm. there was a business case there, which was really initially around the recruitment, the retention and the development of talent, mm -hmm. which is something that's very hot on the agenda, I think, for many companies at the moment, particularly mm -hmm. if millennials are going to make up three quarters of the workforce in the next couple of years. So that was largely, yes, there might be some good PR around mm -hmm. it as well, but it wasn't a PR initiative. It had mm -hmm. to be driven with a business case. It had to have a P&L that would be, yes, cost neutral, but it would deliver these other benefits to the business. Yeah. Having said that, that got us in when we started to pilot and get the things going. We start to come up against what I often describe as the sort of corporate immune system. So you can get a leader to support it. You can get some seed money. You can get going. But um, we were, frankly, flying in a very different, flying really against the flow of, of where business was actually going. Mm -hmm. Big consultancies at the time. They do their pro bono on the side, but their main business was working for large, successful companies in developed, mature markets, selling well-proven pro approaches and methodologies mm -hmm. and paying good people a lot of money yep. to get the best results. And here was this idea that said, we are going 180 degrees mm -hmm. uh, opposite from that. We're going to work in developing countries where there is no proven market. We're going to work for charities that can't be big commercial mm -hmm. clients of ours. We're going to pay our people half of what we normally pay them. And the irony is actually we, you have someone's salary, but in this context, we found that you would actually, they would step up a, a gear or two hmm. in terms of their output. And when I last spoke, I think the, the, the latest number is there's over 40,000 people now on the sort of waiting list, the interest list to do this within Accenture, which is, you know, Show me another company that's got half their, you know, that's got 40,000 people queuing up to half their salary. Yeah, it's it's yeah, unusual. Yeah. It's counterintuitive. And the, the immune system, what were the, some of the kind of the biases at work that you were bumping up against? Any in particular? <laughs> I need to be, uh, I, I need to sort of slightly, <laughs> oh, slightly diplomatic. I, I don't have to be as diplomatic as I did when I, you know, it's very liberating when you leave a company. You probably mm -hmm. found this mm -hmm. too, that you can say what you want unfiltered by yeah. corporate comms. But I would say that a lot of support from leadership that's my caveat, really at, at all levels. Initially, it was kind of air cover mm -hmm. while we got off the ground and did this unusual thing. Then we had leaders to help us take it forward, to help us sort of celebrate our successes. So with that caveat, the challenges were, weren't probably at the senior, most senior mm -hmm. levels of leadership. I think it's more at the sort of N minus a few. Middle to senior management, I'd say doing their jobs, executing on their objectives, enforcing a policy, whether that's a policy around compliance on legal and commercial arrangements or compliance on risk management arrangements or profit targets or whatever it happens to be. If we take the processes and technology that makes large multinationals very successful and scale hugely and try and apply that to a startup effectively, mm -hmm. then it starts to kill it. And that's what I describe. It's the immune system is really, it's an invisible thing. It's cultures, it's norms, it's attitudes, it's performance appraisals, it's traditional KPIs, all of which somewhat invisibly conspire to snuff out innovation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because I mean, as you say, they're doing their job, they're doing what they're paid to do. Presumably the incentives were in line with the old model versus the new model, for example. Correct, exactly. It mm. Paid what they're supposed to do and delivering what they're supposed to yeah. do. Whereas the highest level, you can say, look, this particular rule or this particular decision is wholly inappropriate mm -hmm. in this particular context. Yeah. But that's not able to be done unless you're at the very top of the business. Okay. So why don't we get into some of the work that you were doing? And I love, you know, the before we get into this example, just wanted to quote, you write in your book, if purpose was a drug, 
I was an addict and a drug dealer. So you were quite excited about what you were doing. I loved, I absolutely loved what I was doing. It was, <laughs> I, I genuinely felt I had the best job in the company. I had the best, there was no other job I wanted outside of the company. Yeah. It was, and, and it wasn't just me. This was a lightning rod for talent. Mm -hmm. We've got some internal research that showed that it was a disproportionate number of our best performers mm -hmm. who were most interested in this kind of work who were most interested in feeling that their logistics or supply chain expertise could be applied, not just to getting soap powder into a supermarket yeah, yeah. At more efficiently and at lower cost, but actually to getting medicines or vaccines the last mile in the distribution chain. Yes. That gets people out of bed and they don't need to be paid, you know, top salary to do that. They are prepared to be paid less than they would normally be paid to do that. And was this, um, were people at a certain stage in their career where they were just tired of the same old, same old, and wanted a break, or is it, was it something more substantive, do you think? I'd say it was a whole mixture of motivations mm -hmm. we discovered over that time. Some of it would be people getting a bit disengaged and would come back more engaged with the company. Some people saying, I'm about to leave, I'll do this as my swan song, yeah. and then deciding, actually, I no longer want to leave, mm -hmm. I'm reinvigorated. Some people wanted a good story to tell in an MBA application, frankly. All of these things, and we do a little bit of screening, we do a mm -hmm. little bit of training, we wanted people to be there for the right reasons, and mostly they were there for the right reasons because they wanted to make a difference with their core skills and to see that difference more tangibly than, you know, 20 basis points on a share price or, or, yeah. a, or a cost budget. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, let's get into an example just to bring it to yeah. life. And I think you, you touched on it, but I mean, you talk about it in the book, Project Last Mile. Can you just talk a little bit about that project just to give a sense of the kind of work sure. you were doing? So the work we were doing, I would... I would say it was almost like three phases during the 13, 14 years that I was heading up this, this mm. group a long time. In the first 1.0 version, we were really just working with NGOs, the kind of, it's quite binary. Accenture worked with big businesses, we'd work with non-profits, mm. and we'd do everything from their technology, their back office systems and processes, strategy, knowledge management, change management. It was all relevant to NGOs. Mm -hmm. The second iteration, probably five years in, was where we started to get into partnerships with businesses and Gates foundations or other foundations or donors. So we'd have these cross-sector partnerships that would mm -hmm. be called more coalitions around a particular problem. And then the more emerging and more interesting thing which comes to the project last mile was where we really get into sort of system solutions to big problems where we almost play a brokering and a convening role mm -hmm. around big problems. And so I, I like this project last mile because it's something that everyone can kind of relate to whether they're in business or, or not. Why is it that Coca-Cola can get fizzy drinks to, what's their marketing phrase, within an arm's length of desire or whatever, anywhere in the world, yeah. and we cannot get vital medicines to, to where they need to go in developing countries. It's Why a is sobering that? question, isn't it? It's a sobering question, and, and Coke have been probably asked that ad nauseum over the years, and they've kind of said, well, you know, the answer is probably not to stick vials of, of you know, chilled vaccine on a bumpy road in, a, in the back of a Coke lorry. Mm. The answer is really technology transfer and knowledge transfer. Mm -hmm. And so conversations took place between the Global Fund, which is the big fund for um, HIV and, and, and TB and malaria, the government of Tanzania initially, their health system, Coca-Cola offering the expertise of the local bottlers, and that's expertise in things like inventory management, and even their routings were very kind of innovative mm -hmm. and trying. And, and we provide the glue. We'd have about, let's say, half a dozen of our smart technology stroke supply chain people integrating across these different players to see where efficiencies could be made, where Coke's best practices could be applied to the health system. Mm -hmm. And you'd see things like the lead time of essential medicines could be brought down, the costs could be brought down quite significantly. And that then, latterly, the US government has come in, Gates Foundation has come in, and they're scaling that to many countries in Africa. It's a project that's still going. Mm -hmm. I don't believe ADP is involved anymore, but it's being scaled up quite significantly. So it's a system solution to an age-old problem. That kind of thing, I get, I mean, just out of interest, I mean, how did ADP, I mean, there was lots of good positive marketing, I guess, for all the players in, in that kind of program. Well, there would be marketing, but again, I was very, we almost underplayed ADP. Mm -hmm. Some people would say it was Accenture's best kept secret, why didn't we do more about it? We, we marketed it a lot on the recruitment campuses yeah. and yeah. at MBA schools where people were, you know, taking internships with us and wanting to, to, to join Accenture maybe rather than a competitor because of this opportunity. But I, I would say, yeah, there was some academics did some research around it and publicised it. What I think it was good for Accenture, and this was where the business case, the original business case that I described to you about people was enhanced in this 2.0 model. 
which I can tell you was not something that was on my radar back in the in the Balkans uh, on these kind of winter evenings. We were able to extend and enhance the relationship with our commercial clients via ADP. The client partner for Coca-Cola, who would own that relationship globally, was only too delighted to speak to the chief executive. The chief executive of Coca-Cola would talk about this project a lot. Yeah. And it, difficult to measure in a business case sense what difference that made to our work, but it definitely enhanced the relationship and deepened the relationship with our commercial clients. And that was something that was unforeseen. Because I, I presume that Coca-Cola had got the same issue that, that Accenture had, which is people asking the question, you know, how can we actually bring some, if we can get a Coca-Cola bottle this, this far into the into the marketplace, why can't we do it for other things? So there's a sense of purpose, I guess, for the employees as well within those kind of organisations? There would be. I'm sure there would be. And I'm not close to exactly how much they marketed that internally. But you'll see it as well with the drugs companies in terms of them looking at ways of getting their employees more Mm -hmm. involved. I know GSK, for example, was an organisation that set up a similar volunteering programme for its employees to get them to go out and and use their skills in different countries. And that was a big recruitment differentiator. Yes. And as someone said, it wasn't, it's not an original quote, I wish it was, but if you want to think out of the box, then you first have to live out of the box. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing the correlation between sort of innovation coming when you get people out of their cocoons, their daily life, they go to a different context, apply their skills in that context they will see quite obvious innovations or Mm -hmm. innovations that appear obvious to them that are not in the least bit obvious. And then if they can bring them back into the parent company, we found that to a certain extent, and I believe other companies have found that too. Yeah, Yeah, because I I guess what you're doing is, as you say, you're you're exposing them to a completely different marketplace uh, way of doing business, which they wouldn't be exposed to if they were normally on the traditional sales and delivery model in the core business. Well, every company talks about giving its employees international experience, Mm -hmm. and we were doing that, but it was also cross-sectoral experience, working at the nexus between government often and NGOs, but also cross-cultural as well. And yeah. I think we get into these cultural kind of tram lines, if you will, and, and it's great to be exposed to people who think differently from mm-hmm. you and act differently and have a, a very, very different upbringing. That, yeah. I think, yeah. is very positive. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the, I think the other thing, so there's the innovation piece, and then, of course, there's the ecosystem piece, which is, as you say, working with partners or clients in different ways and extending through these partnerships, which is a 2.0 model. Yeah, and the 3.0 model, absolutely. People would often be given more responsibility as well than they would maybe get if they were on a 100-person team at a big traditional client project. They would be working at the C-suite, dare I say that term, level often, and they would step up a gear in their performance. Mm -hmm. They would see very directly the impact. It uh, was a very enjoyable journey, let's say. And then the journey came to an end. Well, I have to say that ADP is still continuing. Um, For me, the journey with Accenture Mm -hmm. came to an end rather abrupt one, if you will. It wasn't as abrupt as it as it sounds. I mm. had this experience that was a bit of a wake up call to me. Yeah, when you find yourself in in that sort of unusual situation of, of being in a hospital. And what actually wondering, yeah, was this a breakdown or more of a breakthrough? How can I use this crisis as an opportunity for change? And that's where the idea to write the book came about. Can I talk about this journey? Can I be quite frank and open about where we had some successes and there were plenty mm-hmm. through the team? I'm mm-hmm. very proud of of what's what's been going on and also some setbacks and and the book goes into that i also do feel that it's an opportunity to fly some kites a bit about yeah. where where business could go and well, let's, where let's talk about going. a little bit about that yeah. i mean that that's the kind of that's the i mean you talk about the perfect storm a little bit in the book don't you yeah i describe this is really where the business context is changing a, a great deal and i think there are a lot of new strategic drivers that are going to shape business strategy over the next five or ten years mm-hmm. quite quite fundamentally One is around societal expectations are changing. Employee aspirations are definitely changing, even Mm -hmm. from the time that this happened to Mm -hmm. me. And also, I believe that there is a business case for businesses to engage in social issues. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if I unpack each of these, the societal expectations, well, recently, earlier on this year, we were seeing what BlackRock CEO Larry Fink is saying about businesses and his the firms that he and his fund invest in Mm -hmm. need to have a stronger story than just making short-term profit. There needs to be an embedded purpose. And that's, you know, leopards may well be changing their spots in some way. Eyebrows were raised. Mm -hmm. People listen when they say that. But that, I think, is a bellwether for where society is going. And if in a world where we've got 70% of the largest economies in the world being businesses, then that economic clout is huge. And with that power comes responsibility. They are undemocratic at the moment. They are controlled by the few, impacting the many. That, I don't think, can go on. And, And so there's something in the book about how we bring 
greater democracy to mm. the corporation. The employee aspirations, and there's some great surveys around what millennials want, but they definitely want different things, let's say, from when you and I were coming out of university, going into our first jobs. I measured my success on my headline salary, mm-hmm. and I would be happy if I got a grand more than yeah. the next person. And I, I noticed, actually, the back. Your, your starting salary was £500 more than me, I noticed. Well, there we go. I was obviously much better than you then, Mark. <laughs> Clearly, I've sort of moved on in that. And clearly, I think our, you know, the people behind us, the salary, as I've explained, doesn't seem to be the headline. They want to feel that they can be making a difference of some kind in their jobs. Mm -hmm. And the companies that can accommodate that and can harness that and, and, and embrace that kind of innovative potential in employees, that's really what this entrepreneurship movement is about is harness it. It's mm-hmm. a good news for you. The answers lie within your organization and you will be able to attract and retain this new generation of employee that doesn't respond to the traditional levers of I'll give you more of a bonus or I was earning 500 more yeah. than you. And the third area is really around the fact that I'm not preaching corporate social responsibility or this needs to be put more money into the foundation and business needs to do some good. We can no longer have, you know, on one hand, here's where we do our business. And on the other hand, here's where we do our good. And we give some money into these responsibility programs. These things are converging. I believe there is a convergence taking place across the sectors where some of the challenges that we normally consider to be an issue for Oxfam or or Save the Children or the United Nations are becoming strategic business issues. Mm -hmm. So social is becoming strategic for business and business can actually see, call it the sustainable development goals, these big goals, these big list of, of, of challenges. These are actually business opportunities yes. in disguise. Yes. If we reframe the problem and if we change our business model yep. and if we're not necessarily pursuing maximizing profit next quarter. Mm-hmm. And which companies are really going after this? Which ones in the public domain, you know, have have taken this logic and embedded it in, in their in their strategy, their raison d'etre? Any that stand this, out? Well, everyone will the names of CEOs that come to, to mind are obviously Paul Pullman and, and Unilever gets credited a lot. Yeah. Um, DSM's chief executive, Fike Sibinsa, is uh, probably said his name wrongly, but um, also a Dutch company, came second in the Forbes mm-hmm. uh, Sustainability Top 100, I believe. They're great. Dutch. They seem to be the, the Dutch are probably head and shoulders above the others in yeah. many ways, both literally and metaphorically, I guess. But not only Dutch, you've got um, other companies, I think, GSK I've mentioned before, Barclays from an entrepreneurship uh, perspective, Mm -hmm. Barclays is doing a lot with its employees and trying to sort of nurture and do training that will allow them to to drive change. Danone, I think, is another one and you'd single out. Mm -hmm. But my point in the book is that these are almost exceptions that prove the rule. I am not seeing the necessary change being driven top down from the CEOs. So the message really isn't about the power of bottom-up change, about the power of millennials just taking that step individually and collectively to bring change into the organizations and to shift the super tankers, maybe a one degree in one in that direction or one degree in the other direction. For CEOs, it shouldn't be a threat. The message is embrace this change, embrace the innovation potential from within. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Because your, you know, your stakeholders are going to demand it, society is going to demand yes, it. Yes. Yes. Okay. Brilliant. Let's begin to wrap this up. Well, firstly, I sent three questions across to you at the beginning before we met. And the first one is, um, what have you changed your mind about recently? I think it's a, it's a really, really good question because I think there's one trait of entrepreneurs and probably colleagues and bosses would uh, attest to this is that you're incredibly stubborn and set in your ways mm-hmm. and you don't change your mind very often. Mm-hmm. And I'm I'm as guilty as that as the, as the next entrepreneur, let's say. Yeah. I Since leaving the firm, I do think I have... The met, back to the metrics of success, mm-hmm. I think very differently about how I judge myself and yep. what I'm doing. And it's a little bit about moving from a focus on doing and achieving mm-hmm. and delivering to actually a, a focus more on being and actually less is more and actually taking some time out and not judging myself by these yep. other metrics of success. Certainly not in terms of salary, yeah. <laughs> because I'm not earning a salary, yeah. Yeah. anything like what I was doing uh, in the past. So, yeah, it's really been a a shift in opinion on that in that the things that we think are are quite trivial and and unimportant and they don't get us anywhere and they're certainly not on our annual objectives Mm -hmm. may be the very thing you should actually be doing and maybe the thing that will fulfil you more Mm -hmm. than other things. Yeah, and yet the things that we're we're trained to focus on are probably getting in the way as well, right? Completely, which is back to the corporate immune system. Yes. You know, the annual objectives and KPIs. If I had been chasing them, I would have never been able to 
set up ADP. Yeah, yeah. Okay, very good, very good. Secondly, where do you go to get fresh perspectives to help you solve problems and make decisions? What you mean beyond uh, listening to the innovation podcast uh, backlog <laughs> of, of innovation ecosystem uh, things? I'm going to answer this question. I mean, there's no shortage of places out there like mm-hmm. your podcast, which is excellent. I think we are, there's no shortage of these of stimuli, if you will, if we want to look for them. My answer to this would be a different one, is that I actually try and go into myself or go mm-hmm. to a quiet place where you can actually shut out some of these things. Yep. Nothing against what you're doing with innovation ecosystem. There's a time for that. But I feel that too many of us, me included, have been in a state of semi-distraction in our day-to-day life. So many stimuli, so many things to read, so many tweets and Mm -hmm. Facebook things. And is it any wonder that that kind of suppresses, I think, real creativity and innovation? And when I get myself to a very quiet place, it might be somewhere on a faraway, you know, island or Bali or something like that, if I can, and just cut off. Mm. and be still, then I actually find it pays huge dividends in terms of creativity and ideas and thoughts and new perspectives without having to read anything, without having to listen to anything yeah. or whatever. Yeah. It's, the ideas are probably will bubble up if you can get quiet enough. And actually in the book, I mean, that was one of the things that came out as, as you were describing, you know, your experience in the ward, in the, yes. in the hospital. I mean, you know, they took away your phone, right? And you were actually, um, I sensed the way you're writing it, that you, as I was reading it, that it was, uh, it took time for you to get used to the fact that I can't check my email messages. But then the other thing that struck me was that you, you'd actually been huge, you'd overuse your phone at a few I'd days I'd overuse my, my phone. I'd gone through uh, an episode, and again, I talk about this in the book, but it, I went through a, several days before going into hospital, I had had a fever coming back from a trip to India, a business trip, a, a leadership retreat, and it triggered a manic episode or, or I, and I wasn't sleeping. Mm. I was having ideas and flow and creativity. It would, something that probably people pay a lot of money in uh, illicit drugs to, uh, to experience the kind of flow and euphoria and, and yeah. everything was possible. Nothing was impossible. And, you were and I was recording these yeah. ideas yeah. in the middle of the night <laughs> and a, a letter to my boss a resignation letter, an idea, Mm -hmm. and the next idea was better than the previous idea, and the third idea, it was a a craziness, a mania that got out of control. Although I revisit, and it's quite difficult revisiting Mm -hmm. a a breakdown and trying to distill out, were there any, in amongst all that craziness, were there any gems of ideas Mm -hmm. that could actually be brought forward? There's plenty of examples of where more creative people, artists like Van Gogh or musicians, do their best work in somatic states. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was trying to see whether whether there was anything that, and I, well, you can be the judge if you read the book as to whether any of the ideas do have merit. Absolutely, absolutely. And then thirdly, I mean, you know, what is your most significant, you know, low, what have you learned from it and how have you applied, the, how have you applied, or how are you applying that learning perhaps? We've been trying to say, uh, yeah, the answer is uh, just uh, read this book. But I, I, I think, yeah, probably a low, finding yourself in a psychiatric ward, as someone who considered himself, you may argue differently, but I consider myself normal. Mm -hmm. Uh, I had no history of any mental health issues. I've had Mm -hmm. none since. I was happy. I was contented. I had enough money. These challenges were for somebody else. It Mm -hmm. wasn't people like me. I was very lucky. But I'm taking my hand up and saying this did happen to me, Mm -hmm. and it was a low point. But you can't change what happens to you. You can only change really how you respond. And it's this old adage of turning a crisis into an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And I've tried to do that in the book and try to kind of say, well, is there an opportunity for me to share this experience or share some learnings from this experience to hold the mirror up to the system Mm -hmm. and to try and catalyze, if you will, action with others to say, you know, small change inside large organizations can make a big difference. You don't have to end up in in a hospital like I did, but you need to take action and it will pay back. And I can honestly say three years on now that life has changed quite dramatically mm-hmm. for me and I feel much more confident, much more um, much more contented in yeah. what I'm doing than I did when I thought I was bulletproof. Yes, yes. Well, and also, I mean, we, we work together at the League of Entrepreneurs and I think what always strikes me when I'm, when I'm with them is not just the passion, but also how, how relieved people are when they realise that they're not alone. <laughs> Their experiences are actually pretty pretty universal for people trying to make change in large organizations. It's, different. it's difficult being the odd one out, the mm. oddball, the, you know, the, the, the sheep that breaks from the herd. The League of Entrepreneurs, I think, is an excellent, it's almost like you're Alcoholics Anonymous yep. for uh, recovering, you know, entrepreneurial talent in business who feel 
that their views are not being either listened to or they're not being heard or there are other people like them. And I would encourage people to sort of join up and sign up to that. Um, yeah. It's a great movement, and I think this is this is going to grow around the world. Yeah, and actually, one of the resources is, is their toolkit, which is very helpful for entrepreneurs. But for the executives who are listening and who wanted to get a different perspective, it's worth downloading this and just looking at some of the issues that people, most likely people in your organisations, are facing trying to make change happen. So, in terms of getting a different perspective, this is what it feels like in the trenches of making this stuff happen. Completely. I, I wrote a blog recently on on Huffington Post uh, called "Managing the Mavericks," which is targeted at. CEOs, yes. which is basically asking the question that starts off, you know, would you hire an Elon Musk or a Jeff Bezos or a Richard Branson? Yes. And of course, the answer would be yes, we, 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 we would if they happen to be applying to our company. The message is you probably have these people within your midst or had them. Yeah. And they may well have actually left because you haven't had the right systems and process and culture top down to bring that kind of innovation bottom up. So it's there is a wake up call, I think, to leadership and CEOs mm-hmm. and companies that they need to embrace and harness the power of the entrepreneurial talent yep. within their midst. Yep. Brilliant. Where can people get in touch with you, Gib? We'll put those resources in the you know the blog and um, some things in the show notes, but where else, where can people get in touch with you if they uh, want to, you know, re- having read the book or they want to, they want to just get in touch and find out uh, and, and get to know you a little bit more? There's a website, gibbuluch.com, mm-hmm. and you can sign up for a fairly regular blog. The blog yep. I call The Blog which is a bit of a play in words, but that comes out fairly often. Twitter, at Gibbulloch, and LinkedIn, the usual way. Wonderful. Well, we'll put that in the show notes. I really enjoyed the book. It will have come out by the time this goes live, but I, I do recommend it. 10th and of April. 10th of April. And we will um, look forward to hearing how that goes. And thanks, as always, for, for your time. This is a face-to-face interview, so it's a bit different from normal, but thank you very much. It's great to be here face-to-face. And to know that my starting salary was 500 more than yours. <laughs> right again. <laughs> Thanks for the opportunity. Okay. Thanks. So I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Gib. It, it was an honest conversation. He's been very transparent about his challenges as well as his successes. And I'm sure that many of us can relate to different parts of his, of his experience, both good and bad. And many of you work in large corporations. And an important reason for you listening is to gather ideas and practical examples of how to have the greatest impact within your ecosystem. And Gibbs' story is a ter- terrific example of that. And the example that he uses of using a future press release to grab the attention of the chairman of Accenture is, I think, really fantastic. Most of us would have probably put together a PowerPoint presentation and a spreadsheet to make the case. But by making the chairman look at the proposal from a very different perspective, Gibb was able to create the opportunity for the meeting. And the rest, as they say, is history. And for those of us leading large organizations, Gibbs' message that the type of not-for-loss programs we discussed remain the exception rather than the rule should be a call to action. And study after study has shown that there are real benefits in recruiting and retaining talent and making it more productive by being able to communicate purpose, both at the individual and organizational perspective, and and living that purpose through action. And this this isn't touchy-feely stuff. This is about recognizing that by 2025, millennials will constitute 75% of the workforce and that organizational policies, practices, and norms must change to reflect this. And as Gibbs says, we'd all say yes to hiring a Richard Branson or an Elon Musk, but we need to ask, what are we doing to discover them already within our ranks to be able to hear and listen to their perspectives? So just wrapping this up, thanks very much for listening. Hope you found my conversation with Gibb of interest. you can be able to check out the show notes on our website, as well as get a copy of his book, as I say, it is a fantastic read, and it's a very different kind of business book from many of the ones that we tend to spend our time reading. It's well worth it, I can assure you. So without further ado, this is Mark Bidwell, Changing Perspectives, one podcast at a time. <laughs>